What is going on? Men, warriors, gunfighters, welcome. Let's get together today and talk about guns in this virtual tribe. Specifically, let's talk about a gun or a gun family, the Beretta M9 and Beretta 92. What I believe to be the best combat handgun of all time. With that, I'm going to plug in the bio, and then we'll get into the topic. Who am I? A question we should all ask ourselves. I am, first and foremost, a servant of God made in his very own image, a follower of Jesus Christ, a simple man called by God to the Great Commission to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Next, a little bit about my background and what God has allowed me to do and blessed me to do in life. Grew up what most would consider very poor in the backwoods of the southeastern and mid-Atlantic United States, hunting and fishing. Joined the Marine Corps at 17. Did a couple of combat tours in Iraq. So a decorated Marine Corps combat veteran. Infantry assaultman. After the combat tours... I was an urban warfare instructor for the United States Marine Corps under Mojave Viper. I also served in the U.S. Army, both full-time and part-time National Guard. Also a veteran of law enforcement. I served with LAPD. I was a sworn peace officer, a cop for LAPD. I worked regular patrol assignments and more specialized assignments. One of those more specialized assignments was warrant service, fugitive recovery. Also had some other law enforcement roles. I am an FBI certified firearms instructor and been certified by another three-letter government agency in a lot of firearms and training things. I've also been a private contractor, worked in the private sector, Pertaining to tactics and gunfighting and protecting America from enemies foreign and domestic. I served as the commander of a tactical team to stop active shooters in a large metropolitan area. That was our primary mission to stop active shooters, which sadly are a thing in America today. I've also been blessed to do quite a bit of competition shooting Started my first formal competitions even before joining the Marine Corps at 17. I had one more shooting competitions than I can remember. I have competed in all manner of disciplines in shooting. I've been blessed to be a state rifle and pistol champion. West Coast regional champion. Like I said, been blessed to win more shooting competitions than I can remember. I mentioned hunting. I've hunted to put meat on the table. Starting when I was a child, I've also been a professional big game hunter and guide, hunting and slaying all manner of beast. And I don't apologize for that. Humbled to be the host of three podcasts. Simple Man Sermons, Alpha Male Podcast, and Gumfighter Life. Obviously, as things not mentioned, I've been blessed to do many other things. But, again, first and foremost, I'm a servant. A servant of God, a believer and follower of the Bible, the Word, Jesus Christ. And I don't apologize for that. With that, if you want to thank me for any of that service, an easy way to do that is to scroll down and give a review of the podcast. Also, before we transition away, from the bio, I do want to mention that 
I did carry the M9. In the military, both the U.S. Army and the U.S. Marine Corps, I carried it during war. I carried it fighting a war. So there's some real-world first-hand experience there on the M9. I've also obviously used it as a civilian. I've used it for training and things like that. Why do I think that the Beretta M9, Beretta 92 is the best of all time? I know people say the GOAT, the greatest of all time, but I'm going to say BOAT, the best of all time. Why? Because. The best of all time. Why do I think that? Why do I think that the Beretta is the ultimate combat handgun? Notice I said greatest combat handgun of all time. I chose that phrase carefully. I did not say the greatest handgun of all time. I did not say the greatest concealed carry handgun of all time. I did not say the greatest law enforcement handgun of all time. I said the greatest combat handgun of all time. Having been a U.S. Marine Corps combat veteran, having been... Having been in law enforcement with LAPD and having for years and years and years carried and trained people as a concealed carry, both instructor and somebody who concealed carries himself, they are different. I didn't say that the Beretta was best for that. I said combat handgun. Combat and CCW are different. Combat and law enforcement is different. As much as we kind of see our law enforcement transition and becoming more militarized, I would submit to you that it's a different role. It's a different environment. It has different needs. It has different mission parameters. In concealed carry, you know, a defensive handgun encounter, a few seconds is a long encounter. Most defensive handgun shootings for civilians and law enforcement I believe are start and finished within three seconds so a brief aside check yourself if you see yourself in some kind of crazy John Wick scenario from the time you draw that handgun hopefully justifiably and the last time you pull that trigger it's probably a few seconds now, there are outliers. I realize that. But look at combat for a Marine, for a soldier. That often doesn't last seconds. It lasts minutes or hours. Or hours day after day after day. That's a different environment. It has different mission parameters. A good CCW handgun, to use a common term, Needs to be able to go from 0 to 60 real fast. You have to get that gun from completely generally concealed and in a safe holster position to in action quickly if you want to resolve the majority of defensive civilian handgun encounters and still be breathing. Combat is different. Combat a lot of times... Hopefully, almost all the time, you'll be in at least a fire team, hopefully a squad, maybe a platoon. And in general, if you're carrying a handgun, you're not the point man. You're not the lead guy. You're carrying a handgun, you might be carrying a machine gun. And if that's the case, you're probably not in the front of the stack. If you're like me, I was an assaultman infantry specialized in demolitions. I might be carrying a satchel charge. I might be carrying C4. I might be carrying a rocket launcher, a shoulder fire multi purpose assault weapon with a couple of different rounds for blowing up light armored vehicles, for blowing up bunkers or machine gun nests or whatever. And I'll have the handgun on me. If things start getting hairy, I'm likely going to have a little bit more time to get that handgun out and get my first shot off. And once it's out, it's probably going to be out for a while. Again, different mission parameters. So make sure that you realize that. Just like there's no greatest vehicle. Like a Honda Civic is probably great from going to the suburbs to going to your house every day. 
but it's not great if you're hauling gravel. An F-150 would be much better. Different mission parameters. Likewise, a combat handgun is different than CCW. It's different than law enforcement. So why is it the best? Why is it better? I think to answer that, we should ask, how is it different? Because if it's no different, then it can't be any better. And I say that it is different in a lot of ways than almost all other modern handguns. If you look at a Glock and all its copiers, they have pretty much the same operating system. Polymer, striker fire, same tilting barrel from the Glock to the 320 to a Smith & Wesson m and which I really like, to... Let's say, let's get obscure a Steyr. To even one of Beretta's newer handguns, the, I think their striker fired plastic one is called the APX. An FN509. You know, you look at those, and they may have a few different colors, they may have a few different finishes, but as far as function goes, and this may tick a lot of people off and a lot of people in the handgun world and industry... They're basically the same. You might find one that you like better or you like a certain brand better or maybe even more legitimate things like one points more naturally for you. It has a better grip angle for your ergonomics. It has controls that are more easily usable by you. And for you, that might make a difference. But for a mass issue to an army, that's not really a thing because you're going to have thousands and thousands of different troops with thousands and thousands of different ergonomics and hands and whatnot. But all those basically have the same operating system. Really. So let's look at how the Beretta differs. Well, it's very different in that it has an open top design. You look at, again, a Glock, an FN, an M&P, they basically all have the same design take all the slides and all the barrels and drop them on a table, they're pretty much the same. They have a little bit different fit and finish. The Glock may look like a 2x4 and the other one may be a little bit more rounded, but basically they're the same. The barrels fit in the same. They lock up the same. The Beretta has an open top design. If you've spent any kind of time driving a handgun hard and fast, you'll know that quite a few malfunctions happen when you get brass somehow in the, between the slide and the barrel. Call it a stovepipe, call it a double feed, call it failure to eject, failure to extract, all those things. Well, that Beretta open top design, I won't say eliminates it, I won't say it's impossible, but it's way, way less likely because there's less crap in the way. There's more open space to let that brass be free. Fly away, little brass. You know, there's, there's more room to let that brass, once it's done its job and that weapon is fired... That brass can go a lot of different places and be out of your way. And as long as it's out of the gun, then you're who cares? So, a, you know, rounds that may cause a malfunction in a another platform generally won't cause a malfunction in a Beretta because of that open top design. Also, a great thing about that open top design is you have less reciprocating mass. And if you've ever, like I said, driven a gun hard and fast... Less reciprocating mass on the top helps you shoot faster. And you'll see this in a lot of competition handguns. Uh, the handgun I've won the most competitions with is a Smith & Wesson M&P. And I've had the top cut out of it. And most competitions like the Glock 34, all the older generations, they have a big cut in the top of the slide. Why? Because you reduce mass and you have less mass slamming backwards and forwards. And I don't care how you will... You can control recoil. If you can reduce that recoil, you can shoot faster. That's just a reality. And the Beretta Open Top Design does that while giving you more reliability. Let's talk about another thing that people see as a detriment, but I really, really like. The Beretta Trigger is phenomenal. It is elegant. It is smooth. A lot of people today confuse light with good. Light does not mean good. Light just means light. You can have a very light, horrible trigger. I liken like the best trigger as a good 1911 trigger. I describe that as like 
breaking a glass rod. Like just snap and it's done. I liken a Glock trigger to dragging a piano down a dirt road. It's just gritty and grindy and you never really know what's going to happen next. And then eventually it just breaks. Well, if I cut the weight of that piano in half and drag it down a dirt road, it still sucks. It's just lighter. It's just less of a burden, but it's still not good. The Beretta trigger, I like it. It's smooth, it's elegant, it's refined, it's predictable. It's it's a nice trigger, especially for a combat trigger. I'll be honest, do I think the double single action is the best for concealed carry? No, I don't. Do I think it's the best for a lot of situations? No, I don't. But it has a lot of merit in a combat situation where I might draw that gun out because I hear shooting two blocks away and I'm running into the gunfire as we do as Marines. I might trip and fall. I might do all kinds of weird stuff. I might have to crawl through a window. And I want kind of that first trigger pull to be a good long double action trigger pull. Again, it's a different world. You know, if I'm literally sprinting up a gravel hill to get a good fire and maneuver position on my enemy, I don't necessarily want a super light trigger on that gun. Guess what if I do? I can reach up and cock the hammer. And then the Beretta from the first shot to the last shot has a beautiful, crisp, single action, amazing trigger. Better than almost all, I'll say almost all, because you could probably find, you know, that tactical unicorn, but almost all striker fire triggers. And you're talking about a combat military issued handgun. So what most people would consider a detriment, I consider a plus. The trigger is good. It is a good trigger. Is it great? Is that a 1911 trigger? No, but it's a good trigger. Here's another one that I really like and I appreciate. As a person that is semi-nomadic and moves around a lot and does stuff in all kinds of different environments. And, you know, I'm a survivalist, a prepper. The Beretta is the only common handgun I know. It's not the only, but it's the only common handgun I know with a chrome-lined barrel, just like a machine gun, just like a lot of other military guns. It has a chrome-lined barrel. A lot of benefits to this. It does give the barrel more longevity, which, to be fair, most people are never going to shoot out a pistol barrel. It also gives the added benefit of really, really good corrosion resistance in salt water and maritime environments. We did a whole episode on maritime guns. This gun has a chrome lined barrel. It's a fantastic barrel for adverse conditions and adverse environments. And again, you get it just stock with a Beretta 92, a Beretta you know, M9. It has a chrome lined barrel. You're talking about like a military grade you know, chrome-lined, awesome barrel. And I saved my favorite for last. My favorite thing that differentiates this gun from almost all others, there may be other designs that use it, but none common, is that locking block design. If Once you get good with a handgun, if you are mediocre with a handgun or a beginner with a handgun, this is going to probably make no difference to you. But once you get good with a handgun, I'm talking you can shoot an inch or two standing offhand at 25 yards. You can shoot a couple inches at 50 yards. This tilting barrel locking block design, I think, is superior to a regular, what I would consider every other Browning tilting barrel design. The simple tilting barrel and a slide. I think the locking block has a lot of merit. If you take your Glock in front of you and literally just start pulling the slide back, you'll see that barrel dramatically tilt up. If you do this with a Beretta, you will not see this happen. That barrel stays in line. It stays flat and the locking block drops away. Well, who cares? Well, I care. Because I don't care how good your ammunition is, you will have deviation. Most people refer to it as standard deviation. Which means there will be a different velocity for every round. And when that gun starts to unlock and that barrel lifts up or even starts to tilt up, that's going to affect it. Theoretically, if all your ammo is exactly the same, it wouldn't matter. But since there's little bits of deviation, it does matter. Those rounds can shoot drastically different. And I say drastically, we're talking a noticeable difference at 25 to 50 yards. And most people would say, who cares about that? Well, I care about that. 
This is one of the reasons I think the Berettas are one of the most accurate out-of-the-box handguns without getting some kind of crazy custom build. They are fantastically accurate. Another big benefit, if you've ever lived through an ammo shortage, which if you're listening, you have. If you can comprehend the words that I'm saying, you've lived through the past three years and you've lived through ammo shortages. Now, you should always test. I'm big, if you listen, you know I'm big on testing. The number one criteria for your carry ammo, I'd say number two. Number one, make sure it actually fires. But number two, make sure it shoots the same place as your training ammo. Because who cares how good it performs in terminal ballistics if you don't hit the target? That's a moot point. The Beretta, since that barrel doesn't tilt up, in my experience, and I am not a physicist, but in my experience, it will shoot most loads, same point of aim, point of impact. And again, I think it's because that barrel doesn't tilt up, or it's just ridiculously accurate anyway. I don't know, but I have to believe that has something to do with it. So you still need to test it, but I'm much more likely to find a 115 grain load that hits in the same place as, let's say, my carry 124 grain Spear Gold Dot. That's a big advantage. I like that locking block design. I think it is superior than all the other common handgun designs that we have. So that's how it's different than most modern handguns and how I think it's better for a lot of things. Also, not to be overlooked is the fact that you get a long lineage. We think of the Beretta as you know, coming out in the 80s, that's when it was big. That was when it was on Die Hard and Lethal Weapon, and that's when the U.S. military adopted it. But it's really, if you look back at the history, and I'm not Ian from Forgotten Weapons, but if you look at the lineage of the Beretta, you can see that it's a slow change of good features and adaptations over time. And that's a good thing for the end shooter. You get to reap all the benefits of all those decades and decades of wars fought with those similar handguns and lessons learned and craftsmanship, and you get all that in the Beretta. And I'm probably going to get a lot of haters for this next part, but as, you know, the modern-day philosopher Taylor Swift says, haters going to hate and hate, hate, hate. But you just got to shake it off. But anyway, um, Glock... As far as I understand, and I read a book about the early adoption of the Glock in America and things, and he was not a handgun guy. He made curtain rods and other things and injection molded plastic. But he wanted to figure out how to make a gun cheap and effective that worked. And to be totally fair, he did that. He nailed it. He made a cheap, effective gun that works. But I want a little bit more than that. I can... You heard my bio, I've been a professional big game hunter and guide. I can totally butcher, I can skin, gut, and butcher an elk with a machete. It'll totally work, and it almost certainly won't break. It'll be 100% reliable. But I want something that will work while also being elegant and refined and more efficient. I would rather have a buck 110 slim. Or a buck 110, just a regular old buck 110. It's elegant, it's beautiful, it's still rugged, it still works well. I don't know if I remember the exact quote from Star Wars. I like Star Wars, I'm not a Star Wars nerd. But it's a more elegant weapon from a more civilized age. One of the last benefits. The Beretta 92, it just looks good. Let's be honest. You set that next to a Glock. Just pick out random people that aren't adverse to guns, they're not, they don't have hoplophobia, they're not averse to weapons, they're not scared by them, but they're not gun people, and you just set down a Beretta and then a Glock next to it and have 10 random people walk by and ask them which one they think looks better. What do you think the answer is going to be? The Beretta. You know, as one of the guys I served with in Iraq said, it's not a war crime to look good. And I don't often tell war stories, but I'll tell this one. <laughs> Because uh, it's funny and it's not gruesome or anything. But uh, we had all kinds of packing lists and all kinds of gear. And we were so weighed down with gear going to Iraq. But you know one thing a lot of us didn't have, oddly enough, going to Iraq? Sunglasses. <laughs> so when we got there, we had to buy a lot of times what we could get off the locals. And uh, this one guy in our platoon, weapons platoon, we got what we could get. And he got the opposite of tactical 
sunglasses. If, you know, Tactical Oakleys are on one end of the spectrum and Elton John glasses were on the complete other end, these were pretty far away from the Tactical Sunglasses and people were ragging him about it. And with a dead serious face, and this is a big, he was a big hulk of a man. He turns around in formation and says, it's not a war crime to look good. <laughs> it's just, I still remember it. And in a, in a pretty sad, miserable time, that's a pretty funny memory to remember. But anyway, it's not a war crime to look good. And just because a Beretta looks good doesn't mean it won't perform. I mean, Ferraris look good and they're fast. So now that I've extolled the virtues of the M9 Beretta 92. Let's talk about some cool variants. Now let's say that you have filet mignon taste, but you are on a ramen noodle budget. Let's talk about some of the cheaper versions. Taurus makes copies, I believe licensed copies, of the Beretta 92. They have for a long time. While I don't think they're the same quality, I don't think they have a chrome-lined barrel or things like that, they still benefit from a lot of those features. And I think they may have even been made on the same machines or to the same specifications. So the Taurus, much like a Taurus copy of a Smith & Wesson. Is it a Smith & Wesson? No, but is it? A, does that make it a bad gun? Not necessarily. I don't have first-hand experience running a Taurus, so I'm not going to comment on that. But I know they exist. You may find the next one for even cheaper. It's an Egyptian version of the Beretta. I believe it's Egyptian, called the Helwan. I've seen one of these once in person. I didn't really know what it was when I saw it. I'm not a gun collector, but I think you can get these for really good prices. At least you could back in the day. I don't know if they've become a collector's item. The Helwan Egyptian M9 variant. You may find one of these in a little tiny gun shop that somebody, you know, doesn't want a lot for it because it's just an obscure gun. Again, I can't speak to how good a quality those are, but it has a lot of the same design features and perhaps a lot of the benefits. And I believe the Hellwands are a single stack, so it might make a fine CCW gun. Again, I don't know firsthand. Now, your real common one is just going to be your Breda 92 FS and your M9. And I there are some like really minor differences in like literally the markings they put on the gun. But as far as I know, all the specifications and everything from the M9 and the 92FS are literally the same except for like markings. I don't think you get like a cheaper version if one doesn't say M9 and one says 92. I think they're from what I understand basically the exact same gun with different markings. Next, the A1, which I think corrects some of the drawbacks of the Breda 92, and let's be fair, it came out in the 80s. But the A1 is going to have a rail, and it's going to have changeable sights. Instead of that fixed front sight, and they do make sights that bolt over top of that, but the A1, at least all the ones that I know of, have just a dovetailed front and rear sight like a lot of other modern guns do. so you can change the sights out if you want tritium night sights or let's say the fiber optic sights i do believe the m9a1 is what the marine corps went to which will bring you into the a3 and the a4 now the a3 is the one that did not win the last handgun trial contract i won't get into that that may be a whole nother episode for a whole other day whether that was the right decision or not Anyway, the A3 and the A4, and I believe the difference there, if there, I believe the only difference there is one lets you mount optics. It has an optics ready slide, which in today's day and age is a, is a thing. I have started running optics and I have for quite a while now, and I have to concede they are better. They do give a real advantage, and not all, but most scenarios. The A4, again, I believe is the A3 with the ability to mount optics. Whether it has any other modifications, I don't know. They also make the Beretta 92Xs, which are kind of like the civilian black concealed carry version. I think they have standard size and compact size. If you don't know the compact size, like the Glock 19 version of a Beretta 92 and that compact size is generally referred to as a Centurion. If you want something a little bit smaller, 
there you go. But they make those in the X, and I believe the X stands for being able to mount optics. A couple of other really cool variants, the Enox. We talked about the corrosion resistance of the Breda barrel. Well, if you want a much more corrosion resistance overall, they make the Enox, which is like the stainless steel. Oh, because it looks pretty much all silver. It looks like a silver gun versus a black gun. And the Enoxes are cool. I think they look really good. And then they also make the Wilson Combat Breda 92, which is a Brigadier version, which is generally supposed to shoot a little bit better. They are fantastic guns. And then Langdon Tactical is kind of known today for making like custom Beretta 92s, keeping them kind of alive in today's tactical market. I don't have any first-hand experience with those, but they sure look good on Instagram. But since I've never test-driven one, I can't speak to it firsthand. But those are some pretty cool variants of the Beretta 92. All right, with that, That's pretty much going to conclude the main topic for today's episode. I hope you liked it. I hope you enjoyed it. Whether or not you agree with me, you may totally disagree with me. You may totally think that the Glock 19 is the best combat handgun of all time. And that's fine. You're totally within your abilities to have your own opinions. I don't think that everybody listens to this should agree with me all the time. I'm not that vain. But hopefully you listen to this with an honest an open mind, and are at least open to the things that I said in this episode. If you want to politely post your favorite or best, what you would submit is the best combat handgun of all time, listening on iTunes, you can scroll down and write it in a comment. Say, good podcast, but I disagree that whatever is the best of all time, and then me and a bunch of other people can see it. Feel free to do that. Talked about in the beginning this being a virtual tribe. If you want to be in the inner circle, the cool kids... There's a Patreon chat on there for, it used to be a dollar a month. Recently, I think Patreon changed their thing. I think it has to be $5 a month now. With inflation, that probably a fraction of what it was a year or two ago. It's certainly the fraction of the cost of a box of 9mm ammo anywhere I know where you can get 9mm ammo. So the fraction of a cost of a box of ammo, you can sign up and be part of the Cool Kid group in the Inner Tribe. We talk about stuff like this all the time. In fact, this episode came from one of the patrons. They said, hey, have you done an episode on this? And you know what? I talk about the Beretta 92 sometimes, but I have never done a full episode. So you can thank them if you liked it. If not, you can sign up and tell them why it was a stupid idea and the Beretta sucks. That's up to you. But if you want to be part of that inner tribe, again, go to Patreon. There'll be a link in the notes. Talk about all kinds of cool stuff on there. And a lot of times, hopefully, stuff more important than guns. Tactical tip of the day. Hey, you guys remember COVID? What a crazy time that was. Anyway, today's tactical tip, you remember those old face masks, the blue ones, anything like that, that kind of material, also the coffee filters, things like that. If you're going to oil several guns or large guns, probably doesn't make sense for like oiling, just oiling one small thing, something like a coffee filter or one of those face masks you had just lying around, spraying that with some oil, some lubricant and wiping down your guns to work really well because it doesn't leave a bunch of crud behind if you use just a regular paper towel which you can do and i certainly do because it's easy and it's handy a lot of times it'll leave residue behind coffee filter one of those old diaper face mask things is not going to do that let's say you're wiping down a bunch of guns went to the range whatever spraying one of those face masks with some rem oil dumping some oil on it is likely going to do a better job on a face mask on a coffee filter than on just a paper towel And you might have a bunch of those laying around because it was a thing for a while. So that's your tactical tip of the day. Tactical verse of the day is from Ezekiel. Therefore, son of man, prophesy and strike your hands together. The third time, let the sword do double damage. It is the sword that slays. The sword that slays the great men that enters their private chambers. I have set the point of the sword against all their gates that the heart may melt and many may stumble. Ah, it is made bright. It is grasped for slaughter. Until next time, warriors, stay strong.